Howdy, I'm Rick Partlow. Welcome back to How to Write Science Fiction That Doesn't Suck. It has been a long time since I recorded an episode, and partially that's been because I have been really, really busy with deadlines. I just finished my 69th novel, Taken to the Stars 6, uh, two days ago, and I just had to start in the outline for my new novel, War War Mars 3, uh, yesterday. So life has been throwing a lot of deadlines at me. So there's that. But the main reason I haven't recorded a video isn't because of a lack of time. It's been more of a lack of ideas. I uh, pretty much went through all of the ideas that had come to me and that people had suggested. So I've been out of out of thoughts on what else to say about this subject. And um, I only thought of something today. And the reason I did was because I watched the new Dune movie a couple of times. It's great. I love the movie. And I got into a discussion with a couple of people who were upset because the movie changed some things from the book. Now, I had not read the book since I was a teenager, and when I did, I didn't like it. And I thought maybe um, maybe that had something to do with the age I was at when I read it, um, that I might have changed my mind since then. So I bought it on Kindle, contributing to make it the number one uh, movie tie-in book out there, and read, I've read about, a third of it so far. And I haven't changed my mind. I don't like Frank Herbert's style of writing. Not that it's a bad book. It's a great book. Great ideas. Uh, great world building. But things have changed since then. I mean, the the taste of readers have changed. The nature of readers has changed. Um, what readers expect out of a science fiction novel has changed. And I'm going to get into what that is. The thing that has changed, and I think it has also changed for movies as well and TV shows, is it used to be that having a big idea was all you needed for a science fiction story, be it novel, TV show, or movie. The ideas were the thing, because science fiction was a medium for ideas. Um, or maybe not a medium, I guess. TV and books and movies would be a medium. But uh, it was a genre that was based on big ideas. And I don't think that's changed, but I think that a lot of the ideas that used to be new have been repeated and repeated and repeated to where things like uh, Foundation or Dune or, um, you know, uh, uh, 2001 thing, or Rendezvous with Rama, those were ideas that were new. They were novel back in the day. And now people have read, you know, dozens of books on, based on these same ideas. And it's not that they don't want to read about the ideas anymore, but they want there to be something unique about the book. Whereas the idea used to be the unique thing or the original thing. Now they want something else. And what they want, for the most part, is compelling characters. They want characters who not only are... Um, legendary and bigger than life, like Paul Atreides. They want characters who they can identify with. Um, and that's the difference. Reading reading Dune especially, I look and, and Foundation, because I, I watched the Foundation series on uh, Apple, Apple TV. I knew immediately it was nothing like the books, because I read the books when I was younger. So I, I'm like, maybe I'm... 
maybe I'm like uh, forgetting some things from the books that make it more like the TV show. But no, um, they they took a lot of stuff from later books and put it into the TV show. Um, and I can see why, because rereading Foundation, again, it's about big ideas. And the characters are almost an afterthought. And it's the same way in Dune. Not, I mean, there's characters, obviously, but these characters embody ideas in Dune. Um, they're, 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 they exist to demonstrate what Frank Herbert was trying to say. Um, whereas nowadays, if you read fiction or write fiction, the characters need to not just demonstrate a moral or a theme, they need to reflect the reader. You need to see something of yourself in these characters. And I think that is the main difference in science fiction between the 60s and 70s, especially, and now. Uh, even into the, not as much the 50s, but mostly the 60s and 70s. And I think you saw really t saw the corner yeah, saw the corner turn in the eighties and late late eighties to nineties. Um, so another thing that's that's changed about science fiction and about fiction in general, but most but I know science fiction, so I'm going to talk about that is <coughs> the style of writing that. Uh, is considered, I don't want to say acceptable, but uh, I don't know how to put it. Not not acceptable, but it's preferable, I, I suppose. The style of writing that's preferable now, for one thing, when you have uh, third-person limited POV, which is what most books are written in, he did this, he did that, you tell each scene nowadays. Each scene is from the point of view of one person. I mean, you may say he and she and they, but what is being thought, what's being observed, is all through the window of one of the characters. You can change characters from the scene to scene, but you have to make it known which character point of view is this from. And um, Frank Herbert did not do that at all. Just in the first third of the book, there are countless examples where he does what we call head hopping. In one scene, you, under, you hear what Paul Atreides is thinking. You hear what Lady Jessica is thinking. Uh, you hear what um, Dr. Yu, Yu, I think that's how you pronounce his name, is thinking, and you you never know whose head you're inside. That's and it's not in even then it is not what's called the third person, uh, not limited but uh, omnipotent or omniscient. Third person omniscient is a different style of writing, an older style of writing. But that's not what this is either, really. Third person omniscient is more telling the story from a God's eye view and not hearing what anybody's thinking. Uh, so this is more third person limited POV, except it's head hopping around. That's some people think that's third person omniscient, but it's not. So there's another difference between, for instance, Dune, since that's what I just read or foundation or modern fiction, particularly science fiction, is that let's just say there are three ways you can convey information to the reader. You can convey it via dialogue. You can convey it via just straight uh, exposition. Or you can convey it via the inner thoughts of characters. <laughs> Generally, an author will only do one of these at a time and sparingly nowadays. Uh, Frank Herbert did not 
subscribe to that sort of um, limiting philosophy. He would have in the same scene, he would exposit on things from the God's eye view. He would have characters talk about them and saying things to each other that they already knew uh, or maybe a little clumsily if you ask me, although, you know, he wrote the classic and I didn't, but he would have characters say things in front of somebody else as a to, to teach them about some moment. But that was clumsy, clumsily done. It was obvious what he was doing. And he would hear their thoughts too, all in the same scene. Now, people are going to say, who are you to criticize Frank Herbert? I'm not criticizing him from the view of I can write a better story than he did. The reason Frank Herbert's books are timeless classics and why he has three movies and a sci-fi channel uh, miniseries written from them is because of the ideas he came up with. He was brilliant. He came up with well-researched worlds filled with original ideas and told the story with a theme that echoes through the decades. That doesn't mean that he was good at dialogue. It doesn't mean he was good at um, narrative structure. Frank Herbert told a very interesting and compelling story about of interesting and compelling ideas in an interesting and compelling world. But he skipped the part about interesting and compelling characters, in my opinion. The characters were only interesting in that they were avatars for themes and ideas. Um, for instance, let's compare the famous scene with the Gamjabar and the box of pain that Paul undergoes with the Reverend Mother of the Bene Gesserit. In the movie, the dialogue is spare. Her attitude towards him is not dismissive, but kind of like disdainful. And she tells him only as much as he needs to know. And she wants him to fail. And she shows this this by uh, yeah shows this by her tone by how she treats him. And a modern author um, with a more theatrical bent to their narrative would attempt to do the same thing with words. Would use certain words to describe how she reacts to show how she feels without coming out and saying it or having her come out and say it. In Dune, she treats Paul that way. Then she outright tells him why she is doing everything she's doing. And they have a really long conversation where she explains everything that's already been explained once to everybody else. And you also hear the inner thoughts of Paul and her and Lady Jessica. So that is the difference between modern writers and writers of the 60s and 70s is what you see in the movie is a lot more how they would write the scene. Like, um, for instance, if I'm writing a scene where I'm trying to, exp to give some information to the reader, I would uh, most likely have two characters speaking about something else that would hit the edges of the information the reader needs to know, give them the, the nuggets of it, the kernel, without coming out and saying it, uh, without doing the as you know, Bob. Uh, there's ways to get around that. You can... You can have somebody being tested on a subject. You can see a museum exhibit or a history exhibit 
that happens to be talking about something you want the readers to know about. But just having people say, um, just I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use Dune as an example. This isn't dialogue from the movie or the book, but it, just to give an example, I'm Baron Harkonnen. I have this plot against House Atreides because they're a threat to the emperor and a threat to me. So I'm going to betray them. And this is how I'm going to do it. And the emperor is involved and his Sardaukar are going to help us, which that's sort of what he does. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he comes out and has Baron Harkonnen talking to Fade Rotha and Peter, the uh, Mentat. And basically they're telling each other stuff they already know. And the glossed over reason for this was to educate Fade Rotha on how Mentats thought. But it didn't really work that way. The book, you know, the book picks up. Obviously, it's, it gets into the main plot and things happen. But the info dump of the first few chapters of Dune is nearly as bad as the 10-minute info dump at the beginning of the David Lynch movie, where the Princess Allura has her face appear in the middle of space and explains everything about the world to you for 10 minutes and then fades away. And it's like, oh, one more thing and comes back like she's teasing you, like you thought the movie was going to start, but it's not. And then you get some technical readout to explain some more. And then you get a meeting between the emperor and the navigators guild to explain some, to just exposit some more stuff. And that's kind of what the beginning of the novel's like. I used to blame David Lynch for that, but really that's what the beginning of the novel is like. So that's the way that people used to get information to the reader. Not everybody did that, but a lot of science fiction writers, a lot of highly successful science fiction writers did that. People don't do that anymore. You write a book like that today, and it's not going to sell well. It's not going to, it's not going to be considered professionally done. Not because there's anything wrong with Dune or Foundation, but because things are done differently because the taste of the reader has evolved. I think part of that is due to people consuming more media like movies and TV. They want a more subtle a handling of uh, those scenes, a more character involved one where you're you're finding out as much about the character about the content of the main character as you are about the world that you're building. Um, so what am I saying as far as modern books go? There is nothing inherently wrong with exposition if it's done well, if you can do it in a way that doesn't sound awkward. But I think the problem is people have seen it so much through the years and decades that, you know, it does sound awkward and you do have to do it in a more subtle way. Uh, for instance, Dune was written in the 60s. Now, 60s may not sound that long ago, but that's almost 60 years ago when Dune was written. At 60 years, look what's changed in the culture, in the media. A lot has changed. And some people say, well, what makes a good book hasn't changed, but yet it, it has. Um, not that... You can't tell a story just like, I mean, not just like Doom, but with the same sort of uh, sweeping world building, you know, as Dune. Like um, Christopher Rocchio, and I hope I'm saying that right. Sorry, Christopher, you're listening. Uh, did the Sun Eater saga, which is very Dune-esque. And yet, his main character, in my opinion is a lot more relatable. I mean, you can get into their head a lot more than you can Paul Atreides. Um, not that Frank Herbert shied away from Paul Atreides' thoughts, but when I 
got when I listened to what Paul Atreides was thinking, I never could uh, put a finger on him as a person. He was an embodiment of ideas. So some people are going to disagree with this because Dune is their very favorite novel. And I have the I have the luxury of Dune not being my favorite novel. Not that I hate it or think it's bad. It's a great novel. It's just not one that I like that much. And there's a difference. People don't understand that I can you can acknowledge a book or a movie or whatever is great, is objectively great, without liking it. For instance, um, Schindler's List is a great movie. I'll never watch it again. Not because it's not great and well acted, but because I don't like watching that. It's depressing. It's it's too dark. I mean, it's reality, but I, I'm a history major. I get reality from reality. Um, Titanic. Really well done movie. Lots of people love it. I don't. I, and the reason I never loved it was because I know what happens in Titanic. I know what happens in the end. Um, you know, it, in some historical novels, that's not a big deal. If you're going with like historical historical movies, um, that's not a big deal. But if, if you're going in a, into a movie knowing that almost everybody dies at the end of this movie, it sort of kills it for me. Uh, and for books, for example, it's hard, harder to give an example of this because I don't keep those books around that much that I didn't like reading. Um, for instance, though, uh, Stranger in a Strange Land. There you go. I love Heinlein. I love his writing. Stranger in a Strange Land is an incredible book. Won all kinds of awards and has a huge following. I didn't like it. It's not that it's bad. I just didn't like it. It didn't work for me. Same thing with Dune. It's a great novel. I didn't like it. I mean, Foundation is different. I found the Foundation trilogy, the original one. I haven't read the other three. Um, those are written in the same sort of manner. But I guess I like them better because... I found the subject matter more compelling. Not better built or better thought out. Just it's something I was more interested in. Both great novels. One I like reading, one I don't. That's just subjective. And some people can't separate that. So Dune is objectively a great series of not well at least the first one's a great novel. I don't like it. It's not for me. <laughs> Which makes me able to be objective when I say the reason I didn't like it is because of the choices, either conscious or unconscious, that Frank Herbert made as far as characterization, dialogue, narrative. Um, now you may like those. But I am going to tell you and this is not arguable, really, that the taste of the average science fiction reader today, particularly the people who read indie science fiction, who read, and this is getting into the business end of it, but the ones who you'll be selling your books to, the ones who pay for a KU subscription and get a six-book omnibus set and read it in three days or four days. These are the people they call whale readers. They're the ones who will give you most of the royalties you get. Now, there's others out there who are different, and you can think about them if you like, but you're not going to earn a majority of your pay from those people. You're going to be getting it from people who read a lot of books. And as I said, when you read that many books... There's tropes that you get used to that you have seen over and over again, uh, ideas you've seen over and over again, and you want something a little bit different, not too different. That's the other thing people get the wrong idea about. Um, if you're writing science fiction and 
you think that it's your responsibility to make sure your story is original somehow, um, it's probably not going to work. There's very little originality out there. I've said that before. So you don't have to worry about making things different. Just make sure that when you write your story, you make something that stands out. Not because your main character has three heads and, a, you know, is uh, only sees the color purple or something like that. <coughs> or because your character is, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say this the wrong way because there's a lot of books like this and I don't want to insult anybody. But not because your character is the chosen one or a lost prince or princess or whatever. Uh, but because you you have to make your character fun to read. You have to make this a character that people will get it inside their head and they will care about them as a person, like they're a real person. Because that's what your readers are going to want to read. That's what modern day science fiction readers... I don't know about, you know, the trad market because a lot of the trad market is people who don't don't read what I would call subgenre science fiction. They don't read military, read space opera. They'll go out and get Jurassic Park. That's most of the trad audience. They'll read a lot of fantasy, but I'm talking about people who will go into KU and they'll find a series that you wrote that has 6 or 8 or 16 books in it. And they'll they'll check out. They will borrow. I don't even call it. You know, put it in their in their reading list. You know, as many of those books as they can get at one time. If you have four book omnibuses, they'll get all four of them, and they'll read through an omnibus in like three days. And you will get a lot of money from those people. People think Ku. Oh, they they only pay like under a half cent a page read. That works out to a lot of money if there's enough pages for them to read. And these people will read them all. Okay, so that's who you're dealing with as readers. They've read a lot of this before. They've read Dune. They've read Foundation. They've read all these novels. What you need to do is tell these stories in a way that draws them in with a voice that they find interesting and with characters that they care about. That's the difference now from then. I mean, Paul Atreides is a cool character. So is Lady Jessica. And Chani. But at the end of the day, when I read about them, I was not worried from chapter to chapter what was going to happen to Paul Atreides. Because he was written as somebody who had a destiny and was, I mean, not a good destiny as it turned out. I mean, if you've gone beyond book one. But in book one, he was somebody who had a destiny, who was the chosen one, who was born for this fate. And you could tell that from the beginning. And I did not see him as a character where I was worried what was going to happen to him from the beginning of the book to the end. And that's not to say they should have killed that Herbert should have killed him off or maimed him or something. But if you write a character well enough, people will be worried about them and be involved in their stress and strain and ordeal, whether or not they know that the character's not going to die. Like, now, I'm, I'm not trying to inflate myself to the level of Frank Herbert by any stretch when I say this. But for instance, a lot of people are very invested in Cam Alvarez and Drop Trooper, despite the fact that the books are all written from the first person. So you know that he's not going to die, because otherwise I wouldn't have written all these books from the first person. But... People are still involved in his fate and they're, and they're stressed out for him and what he's going through. Now, there, I'm not saying that 
these people are better writers than Frank Herbert. But for instance, when I read Larry Correa's Monster Hunter International or his Grim Noir series, I get stressed out for the main characters. I worry about them. I, I'm involved with them. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm inside their head in a way. I, I care about them as a person, even though they're not real. <clears throat> um, Jim Butcher in the uh, Harry Dresden novels. I know Harry's not going to die, um, although at some point he kind of does. Spoiler. Uh, but I worried about him up until a certain point when Butcher broke the series, in my opinion. But that's just subjectively, you know. Other people love it, but... Um, so, you know, I, these aren't, I'm not saying that Jim Butcher or Larry Correa are better novelists than Frank Herbert. Obviously, Frank Herbert's timeless. But I cared about their characters a lot more than I cared about Paul Atreides. Uh, I mean, David Weber, um, David Weber is a great writer, but he is famous for the overindulgence in technical detail. And you'd think that would be enough to turn people off, but Honor Harrington is such a great character, and her surrounding cast are such great characters. People put up with multiple paragraphs about non-existing technology because they want to find out what happens to Honor Harrington. And that's just a few examples. Not, I mean, those are all great writers, but they're not on the level of Frank Herbert when it comes to success. And yet, I prefer reading their books because they know how to involve me with the character. Maybe that's just me, but I think I've sold enough books to have a sense of the audience for science fiction in the modern day, in the 2020s, and I think that they want something different. Um, people still read Dune. Obviously, it's a very highly rated novel. But there's a kind of a momentum that you get from having been incredibly successful for decades that keeps on going. For instance, Lord of the Rings, the Lord of the Rings trilogy will always be successful, will always be popular. It's got, you know... Cartoon, live action, uh, six live action movies, and uh, a TV show that sucks about it. <laughs> but if you ask anybody how to write a modern fantasy novel, nobody's going to say write it exactly like The Lord of the Rings. Because although J.R.R. Tolkien was incredible at crafting a world and at building a, a mythos and, a, and telling a, a legendary story, his pacing and his narrative style would not work today. Look at the two towers. Half the book is uh, Helm's Deep and they just he just stays with Helm's Deep for a whole half the book. The other half the book is rock climbing through hell with Frodo and Sam in Gollum. And when I was reading that when I was younger, I read enraptured the whole Helm's Deep part and then was like <laughs> with the Frodo and Sam part because a modern author would intersperse those like they did in the movie. They'd have some Frodo and Sam, some Helm's Deep, some Frodo and Sam, some Helm's Deep. That's the way modern books are written. But J.R.R. Tolkien was a product of an earlier type of writing. And that's not to say that he was wrong or that there's anything wrong with his books. Just saying that you can't write something in the style of the older books today and expect it to have the same kind of success. Because even if you might be telling a great story and a great world building... But if you don't package it in a narrative form that appeals to a modern reader, then it's not going to be successful. Um, 
And when I say how to write science fiction that doesn't suck, I don't just mean um, how to write something that is like the masters. I mean how to write something that's going to sell, that people are actually going to read and be caught up in. <clears throat> and although you can be caught up in those older books from the 50s and 60s and before, you have to know that when people read those, they're reading them with an expectation that this is something from an earlier era and it's going to be different than stuff nowadays. Um, you write something now, people are going to have an expectation this is going to be something that is more along the narrative lines of other books that I've read in the modern day. Um, and when I say modern, I don't just mean like the last 10 years. Don't get me wrong. This is the way books have written from pretty much the 80s, at least the mid to late 80s on. People changed the way that they wrote books, and I think it had a lot to do with media consumption. Um, so it's not like you're going to appeal to the people who like those other books because they, the people who like them when they came out are dead. And the people who like them now like them in the context of them being classics. So you expect it to be different. Just like you expect H.G. Wells to be different than a modern novel or Jules Verne. People go into that knowing it's going to be written differently. You, they go into your book that you wrote in 2021 or 2024. They're going to be like, this is better catch me with action and characterization and keep me with a compelling narrative and a fast-paced plot. And I hope I said that right. I'm not going to try to say it three times fast. Fast-paced plot. Uh, and they're going to have different expectations for you because you are not a classic. You, you don't have 60 years of people recommending you and movie adaptations to get people to read your stuff. So you have to get people involved on a personal level, not on a... <clears throat> I'm reading the Odyssey by Homer level, which is what that stuff has gotten to. And not all of it. I mean, obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of books from back then that are more just brain candy, popcorn. But stuff like Dune and Foundation and Lord of the Rings, this is on a level now with mythos. This, these are myths for modern day. So unless you think that you're going to be the next... Frank Herbert, which I don't advise you to make that assumption, you need to make your books tailored to a modern audience. And you do that by concentrating on getting people involved with your main characters or character. And that's another difference between science fiction back 50, 60 years ago and now. A lot of science fiction, I'd say the vast majority of science fiction from that day was third person. Third person limited. Sometimes, as I said, third person hopping all over the place. Um, and Foundation was a very third person omniscient in a lot of ways. Um, not all the time. But you could get away with doing that back then. Nowadays, people want to be more intimately involved in the, in the head of the main characters. So third person limited POV or and this would not have worked back in the day, first person. I do a lot of science fiction in first person. Some of my favorite science fiction is done in first person. And I would say that the reason that it's more successful now than it used to be is because you're dealing with an audience that wants to, like I said, be that involved in the character's thoughts. They want to hear the character describing things constantly through their eyes um, so they can get lost in not just the story, but in another person. They can step into their shoes. So am I saying you have to do it first person? No. I'm saying, though, that first person or third person limited, you have to 
you have to describe your scenes through the eyes of one character and you have to do it well enough and distinctively enough that people will want to read more from that character. Um, and if you're writing third-person POV with multiple POVs, you need to make sure that every single one of those characters is compelling. <clears throat> I've heard people say, oh, this you shouldn't have more than three or four characters or whatever in third person. You can have as many as you like if you do it well. That's pretty much the lesson of all of this is if you do everything else well enough, you depart from one piece of advice, you can get away with it. That's how Frank Herbert was able to head hop around in, you know, in the same scene, even though it, even at that time, it wasn't something that was usually done. He could get away with that because everything else he did was so good. The world building, the narrative, you know, the, it's not there, the world building, the storytelling, the, the ideas behind it, the themes was all so good and compelling. He could get away with that. Um, there's a lot of other examples of that, uh, of writers breaking the rules of, against things like using too many adverbs or whatever, because that rest is so good. But I can't guarantee that the rest of what you write is going to be that good. So I'm going to tell you to obey the rules until you get to the point where you're confident you don't have to anymore. Uh, when you are successful enough that, and people tell you, you know, repeatedly, you're good enough. Maybe you can get away with breaking the rules. But the rules were made for the average guy. And as far as I know, you're the average guy. Maybe you're not. Maybe one of you out there is the next Frank Herbert or Robert Heinlein. And if you are, I expect you to remember me when the time comes. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, obey the rules as much as you can, unless there's some exception that's going to draw people's eyes to it. But I would I would make sure that you stick to a limited point of view, either third person or even first, if you can get away with that. Some people can't do first person well. You can't, that's fine. But you need to make that third person limited, as limited as you can get it. You need to put it as close into that character as you can. And if you have multiple characters, if you have seven or eight characters that you have point of view scenes from, you better make sure the scene's really good. Um, I would never tell you you can't do that. In my first series, Duty on Our Planet, I have several scenes where there's a one-off uh, character that I just use for that one scene as the point of view character. But when I did that, what I would make sure to do is give that side character, this one-off character, something compelling, a, a story in their head that you tell in that scene. <clears throat> For instance, there is a, a scene in um, The Line of Duty, the third Duty on Our Planet series novel that involved an attack on uh, a city in Europe. And I made up the story of a struggling artist who sees the attack through his eyes. Now, that could be something that people just like, oh, let, let me out of this scene. But I made him have a character arc in that one chapter. And I don't know, maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. You know, other people would have to say that. But I felt like, I felt like that this was an effective way to tell the story of this scene and have tension <clears throat> instead of telling it from the point of view of the main character from which you would have no tension other than, can I stop this? But can I stop this is like a, a sort of a sterile form of stakes when you aren't seeing the people on the ground and seeing what they're going through. Which is why I put the people on the ground and I had this guy who's going for a lunch meeting with his girlfriend and is worried that he's going to die and that she's going to die and he never told her he loves her. And then and he thought that Love was a bourgeois, you know, uh, con, you know, and, and he was all, uh, you know, 
another word I'm looking for, kind of hipster, but this is not really, not really hipster, but he's like one of those artist types from the, uh, from the old days, you know, really hoity-toity and was above all that. But at the end of the scene, after he's almost died and she's almost died and they, they live by the skin of their teeth, he tells her he loves her because that's the, that's the character arc that you go through in one chapter. And you can do that. But it's like I said, if you're going to, if you're going to break these rules, do them well. Do them in a way that people will not say, oh, this, I'm tired of the scene, I want out of it. <clears throat> okay, I'm kind of rambling now. Uh, but basically my point is that um, people now, present day science fiction readers, particularly genre readers who are subgenre readers like military science fiction or space opera, or getting into fantasy, like urban fantasy, or uh, that kind of thing. You know, the the more modern types of fantasy, uh, paranormal romance, I suppose. They want character-driven stories. They want the ideas. They want a cool idea. They want twists in their plot twists. They want good narrative. They want good world building. But the most important thing to them is a character-driven story, and that's the main difference between modern science fiction and the science fiction of the classic era. And when I say classic, I don't mean classical like E.E. Uh, e. E. Doc Smith or, or the early Robert Heinlein. I mean like the ones you see movies made of now or TV shows like Foundation or Dune. Those were idea-driven books and in a time where people wanted idea-driven books and now they want character-driven ones. You may disagree with this and feel free. Um, I can only say that this is what I have learned from my audience, from reading their reviews and reading their emails and chatting with them on Facebook Messenger. And that They're all into the characters. The characters are the most important thing to them. And I think they will be for you too. So I'm going to wrap this up. I hope to get more videos out to you sooner this time. Um, but I am really, really busy. So I have time to record. I do not have time to come up with ideas to record about, particularly since this is not something I do for money. So if you want, if there are any ideas you want me to make videos about, any questions you want answered, please email me at dutyhonorplanet487 at gmail.com or you can connect with me on Facebook at the Science Fiction Worlds of Rick Partlow, which is www.facebook.com backslash duty on our planet. So I will see you next time. And until then, y'all have a great spring.